sign of hope, a new sign of life, we're going out on another mission trip. So this will be the first mission trip since COVID began. We'll do a commissioning service this morning for our friends who are going to, with Sowers of the Kingdom, to the Dominican Republic. So slowly we're starting to see signs of life as we're coming back to worship. We were also talking last week about going back to live music, which I cannot wait until we get back to a live worship band. So stay tuned, that's going to happen soon. Please join me in the uh, call to worship, which is printed on, your, on the screen. Please stand, and I'll just, I'll just read it. It's not on the screen for some reason. Oh, come let us sing to the Lord. We will make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us sing songs of praise and thanksgiving. For the Lord our God is merciful and good. Come let us worship this amazing God.
And please stay standing. We'll praise God together with the next hymn. Each morning before I touch the floor, I'm going to stop and thank you a little more. And each time that I draw my breath, let me pause know I am blessed. You're the one who gave us your love. You're the one who gave us your son. I want to thank you, Lord. I want to thank you, Lord. I want to thank you, Lord, all of my life. As I live my day, let me stop and offer my praise. When troubles surround me with fear, let me pause and know you are near. You're the one who gave us your love. You're the one who gave us your son. I want to thank you, Lord. I want to thank you, Lord. I want to thank you, Lord, with all of my life. You are the Lord of my heart. You are the Lord of my life. You are the Lord of everything. I want to thank you. Each night when I close my eyes, Oh, let me thank you for all you provide. And each time that I draw my breath, let me smile, know I am blessed. You're the one who gave us your love. You're the one who gave us your son. I want to thank you, Lord. I want to thank you, Lord. I want to thank you, Lord, all of my life. I want to thank I want to thank you, Lord. I want to thank you, Lord, all of my life. Now let's join together in this uh, affirmation of our faith. We believe in God the Father Almighty. Read with me here. We believe with God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, 
Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us stand and continue our praise of God. On this thirsty desert ground, in a dry and barren land, I bow down. I need you now. You are calling, I will come To your river I will run, I bow down I need you now O oh, living water O oh, God my Savior If I ever need I need you now, O oh, living water, O oh, God, my healer, if I ever needed you, I need you now. You're the start and you're the God, my Savior. 
living water. Oh God, my healer, if I ever needed you, I need you now. Just like the desert needs the blessing of the rain, just like the winter waiting for the sun again. I need you now. Please be seated. Please join me in this prayer confession, and we'll read this responsibly. Let us pray. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me into the truth and teach me, for you are salvation. For you I wait all day long. Do not According to your steadfast love, remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and Relieve the troubles of my heart and bring me out of my distress. Guard my life and deliver me, God. Do not let me be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. And let us silently open our hearts before God. Let God see your heart and your soul. Let God see all of you as we confess our sins to God. Let us pray. Search us, O God, and know our hearts. Test us and see if there is any wicked way in us. And God, lead us in the way everlasting. Through Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here are these words of assurance. This is from Psalm 91. Those who love me, I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. With long, with long life, I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. Friends, believe the good news. Now please stand and offer a sign of peace to each other. And if you're in the same family unit, you can hug each other and offer peace. <laughs> Please be seated. So now it's time for the children's message, and I'm glad to see we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight more children than we've had in the sanctuary since I've been your pastor here. So this is amazing. Yes. So, um, okay, so I have a, a passage from the Bible that I want to read for you. And this is from the second book of Corinthians, chapter 5, verse 17. And it's a simple passage. But I'm going to say this passage, and then I'll ask you to repeat it, okay? So listen to this passage from the second book of Corinthians, chapter 5, verse 17. It says, if you put your life in Christ, if you put your life in Christ, you will become a new creation. 
Everything old will go away, and everything will become new. That's an amazing passage. So repeat this after me. I'm going to say it again. If you put your life in Christ, say that. If you put your life in Christ, good. You will, you will become a new creation. Everything old will go away. And everything will become new. That's a beautiful passage. That's the heart of our Christian faith. When we put our trust in Jesus, we will become like a new creation. That's the promise God gives to us. And so I want to, we're, we're talking about what it is to become, what it is to become new in Christ. And there's a, there's a um, kind of like a, an analogy, that's a big word that just means um, something is like something else. And the analogy is a caterpillar. A caterpillar is just like this because a caterpillar goes from one way of being and become something new. What does a caterpillar become? Does anybody know? What does a caterpillar become? A butterfly, yes. And aren't those so different? A caterpillar, which is almost like a worm, changes and becomes a butterfly. And so that's like something, something uh, a creature becoming something new. But there's a couple of lessons that I want us to think about, about the life of a caterpillar. And who can tell me, what is a caterpillar like? What's a characteristic of a caterpillar? What did you say? I didn't hear it. It eats leaves. Exactly, exactly. Did you know that a caterpillar eats 27,000 times its own body weight in its lifetime? It eats a lot of leaves. And do you know why it eats those leaves? It has to get really big and plump. And why does it have to get big and plump? Do you know? Right, you guys have done this before. This is like, <laughs> she is exactly right. It, it has to prepare to go into the cocoon to become a butterfly. It needs that, all that energy to prepare. So that's one lesson for us as we become new in Christ. We have to prepare. What are some of the ways that we can prepare to meet Christ and to know Christ? Not like a butterfly we, or, or like a caterpillar. We don't eat leaves, but what, what do we eat? We eat the word of God. So read the Bible. That's one way. Okay, there's another lesson. A caterpillar, does a caterpillar move fast or slow? Slow. The caterpillar moves very slowly. Right. And it's got to be frustrating for the caterpillar, right? It takes them forever to get where they want to go. And that's another lesson. We have to be patient because right now sometimes we have to move slowly. You've got many years of school to go through before you become what, what God is creating you to become as an adult. So we have to go slowly. Um, Here's another point about a caterpillar. Did you know that a caterpillar sheds its skin four to five times in its lifetime? It sheds its skin. So what does that mean for us? We have to, we have to what? We have to grow up. We have to sometimes get rid of our old ways. Every year you buy new clothes for school, right? So that's one thing you shed. But you also maybe shed some bad habits that you have. So we have to shed some things and let go of some things in order to become new in Christ. But here's the most important point. What it is to become new in Christ. Does a caterpillar control becoming a butterfly? Is it the work of the caterpillar or is it the work of God? It's the work of God. The caterpillar can't help it, right? The caterpillar, all the caterpillar has to do is go about its business. It goes into its cocoon and it's going to become a butterfly. It's God's work that creates the butterfly. And that's true with us too. It's God's work that makes us new in Christ. All we have to do is put our trust in Christ, in Jesus, and we will be made new. And so this is the, the lesson, four lessons from the caterpillar. And if you all come on Easter morning, I'm going to give you your own caterpillar. Come on Easter morning, I'm going to give you your own caterpillar. Your own pet caterpillar, right? It's exciting. And then it's going to take about four or five weeks, and that caterpillar is going to go into a cocoon. Actually, I think it's less than four or five weeks. I think it's like 21 days. It goes into its cocoon. And it's going to come out as a butterfly for Mother's Day. And guess what we're going to do on Mother's Day? We're going to release the butterflies. It's going to be so much fun. I was actually thinking about giving you the caterpillars today. But then as I calculated out to Easter, I realized Easter's on April 4th. 
and that would mean it would still be too cold outside and we'd release the butterflies and that wouldn't be good for the butterflies. So I'm going to give you your caterpillar on Easter morning. So come on Easter to get your very own pet caterpillar. All right, let's say a prayer. God, we give you thanks for this teaching that you gave to us in the Bible today, that if we put our life in you, if we put our life in Christ, you will make us a new creation. Everything old will go away and everything will become new. So God, help us to put our trust and our lives fully into your care. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, you can go to your Sunday school now. I have a few announcements this morning. Uh, first, Wesley. Wesley's being ordained as a minister in the Reformed Church um, next Sunday. So next Sunday, March 7th, it'll be in the afternoon at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And you can go onto our website, hrcrca.org, and uh, register for the, uh, installation, for the ordination so you can attend in person. So as you know, over the years, Wesley went to seminary. Now he's got a job as a chaplain at the... Um, Danbury Hospital, and we're ordaining him to that position. Um, so again, that's 3 o'clock here next Sunday. Also next Sunday, we'll, we will begin our Bible study. Percy and I are co-teaching a Bible study on the book of Romans, and I'm so excited about it because the book of Romans is considered to be um, the essence of the Bible. If you want to understand the gospel, if you want to understand the purpose and meaning of the gospel, what it is to live in Christ, that book of the Bible summarizes it better than any other book. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful summary. It's also a dense book, so we're going to be taking this over several weeks. We're going to be going from March 7th through August 8th. And it'll be every week. It'll take place um, upstairs in the community room. We'll also have a Zoom link available for those who want to join by Zoom. But this uh, Bible study will be um, happening from 9.30, so right after this service, 9.30 to 10.30. And, uh, and that'll be every, every Sunday morning from next Sunday until uh, August, August uh, 8th. So we really hope you can join our, our study. Also, Saturday, March 13th, uh, Karen Shogren has put together a family event called Putt-Putt, and it's, I guess it's a, a Putt-Putt golf game, which will be happening here in the uh, Fellowship Hall. So please call Karen to get your uh, tea time. You have to sign up for a tea time, right? So we're... That's a good thing. Um, and also for social distancing person, uh, purposes, be in touch with Karen. You can also go on to the HRC website uh, for more information about that. And let us continue our service of worship with our tithes and offerings. Our offertory song is Oceans. Let us stand. You called me out upon the water. Great unknown, but feet may fail, and there I find you in the mystery, in oceans deep, my faith will stand, and I will call upon your name. My soul will rest in your embrace For I am yours And you are mine 
still bounds in deepest waters Your sovereign hand will be my guide When feet may fail and fear surrounds me And never fail And you won't start now God, you are the creator, and you're the source of all good things, and you have showered us with greatness. If we just stop to think about it, all of the blessings that you've given to us in our lives. And so God, look into our hearts and receive the thanksgiving that we have to offer to you. Thank you, God, for all the gifts, the blessings that you showered on us and our families. 
the healing that you've brought to so many of us who've come through COVID. You are the rock of our spirit, and without you, we would be nothing, God. You provided for our family, our friends, our home, for food to eat every day. You've been so generous to us, and so we give you these gifts as a symbol of our gratitude to your kindness. Bless us, God, with continued graces and blessings throughout each day. May these gifts multiply so that everyone in our community can benefit from them and from coming to know you forever in your glory. Lord Jesus, in your holy name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. There are a few joys and concerns this morning. Um, the first joy is that uh, Hans Mikhail, who was the former vice president of Consistory, his daughter, Sheena, and her family just gave birth to a baby, Olivia. So we're, uh, please congratulate Hans. We're grateful for Olivia's birth. May God bless this new and precious addition to their family and also to our faith family. Any other joys this morning? Great to see you, Ken, and to, to see you uh, that you've come through COVID. I know your whole family, we've been praying for you, so wonderful to see you all here. That's a joy. Wonderful that the O'Malley's are here, yes. This is the first time you've been able to attend in person, right? In, in months, so wonderful to have you here. Um, also some concerns to, to bring up to your attention. Uh, the first is that Les Jackson passed away this week. Many of you probably knew uh, Les. They were longtime members of this congregation. His funeral will be here at the church next Friday, March 5th at 11 a.m. And you can go to our website to register to attend and you'll also find a Zoom link on the website. Visitation will be um, Thursday, to, Thursday from 5 to 8 p.m. at McCool's Funeral Home. So Thursday is the visitation, and Friday here at 11 a.m. is the service. Please also pray for Lynette. Uh, Warren has uh, come through COVID, but Lynette is really struggling with it now. So please pray for her. She's got uh, a lot of symptoms and problems, having complications. So please pray that Lynette will get through this COVID crisis. Uh, from Leslie McConnell, this request comes in. Please pray for my good friend Kathy Bridges Cantrell, who's dealing with the very upsetting news of a cancer diagnosis. Pray for her healing, comfort, strength, and peace. Please, please pray also for Keith Haleman's son, Alex, who is healing. Um, pr pray for the healing of his kidney. He's having trouble with, uh, looks like maybe one of the glands in his kidney, so please pray for him. Scott Snow sent this request in. Please pray for... My work colleague's husband, Clint, who has stopped all of his chemo treatments and is entering into hospice care. Uh, because he has stopped his chemo treatments, his appetite has returned, and so they're bringing him in a fruit basket this week. But please pray for him as he faces the end of life. And Bell sent this request in. Please pray for my niece, Jennifer O'Dean. She has COVID symptoms, and um, so please pray for her. Oh, she also has a a pancreatic, a, a, a spot on her lung and pancreas, which they're concerned about. Soon Yeva sent this request in. Please pray for Eva Kara. Ask uh, prayers for Teresa, who's starting radiation treatments at the Dyson Center. Scott Snow sent this request in. Please pray for the revival of the Hopewell Reformed Church. Amen to that. Please pray for HRC during these difficult times of COVID. We need our church, and our church needs us. If you're unable or uncomfortable attending, we hope you will attend via Zoom. And the question this person asks is, have you been keeping up on your giving? It's easy to uh, stick to your contribution uh, either through uh, putting your offering in the mail or giving on the church website. So the prayer is for our church uh, to get through this crisis. Any other concerns this morning? Yeah. 
Good. So prayers for the decision makers in the school districts and for children. It's, you know, what all the research is showing is that online learning really hasn't worked very well. So prayers for children's education. Other prayers. Prayers for our nation, for governors, and for all people in positions of authority. And Jeff, are there any requests on the Zoom call? Uh, uh, yes, it's a, it's a joy and also a prayer. Uh, please hand his uh, grandma to 100. Wow. That's a terrific joy. You might have to repeat that because people aren't doing what we're And then, Leslie McConnell, prayers and diagnosis for continuing abdominal pain. What was that for continuing? Abdominal pain. Abdominal pain, okay. Wow. Okay, let us pray. God, we have so much to be thankful about, the signs of life and new life all around. We, we're grateful for the uh, birth of baby Olivia, granddaughter of Hans and daughter of Sheena and her family. Uh, we pray that you'd, you'd bless her. And also the, the joy of Trish Hannah's grandmother's 100th birthday. It's just amazing, 100 years. Can't even comprehend that. So we, we give thanks for new life and for continuing life and for all the signs of life around us. God, we're also concerned, all the concerns that we raised and spoke here, we raise them up to you now in a moment of silence. And maybe there were some things that we spoke, and maybe there's some, some things that we, we didn't say, but that are strains that are in our hearts that you can see. So we offer those to you now in a moment of silence. Hear our prayer, Lord. And we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now I'd like to invite Ron and David forward. We're going to uh, do a commissioning for um, Ron and Dave, who are about to head off to the Dominican Republic on this mission trip. And I'd like to invite Percy forward, too, as, uh, as our elder, as we, as we commission our brothers. And you can just stand here. In the uh, first book of Corinthians, chapter 12, verses 4 through 7, it says... There are different gifts, but the same Spirit. There are many ways to serve God, but it's the same Lord. Each one of us is given gifts by the Spirit for the use of the common good. And together, we are the body of Christ, and individually we're members of it. And so we are blessing Ron and Dave as they head off for the Dominican Republic, for Sowers of the Kingdom. Sowers is a ministry and a mission that was started here at the Hopo Reformed Church. Many of you have, have, you have heard about uh, Sowers of the Kingdom. They've done incredible work over the years down in the Dominican. Uh, this trip is going to be about repairing roofs that are leaking, old corrugated roofs that are rusted out. They're going to be replaced. Those are leaking so that there's actually water coming into people's bedrooms and on their beds, you know, so that's going to be fixed. And there's also a mission house that's going to be worked on. We've uh, supported the building of a church down there, and this mission house is connected to the church. Uh, it's a partnership with, uh, in the past with Habitat for Humanity, and so there's all sorts of good things that are going to happen. The Dominican is also a place where um, baseball camps uh, proliferate. And so kids are um, encouraged to join baseball groups, and it's kind of a, a sign of hope for those kids. So we're bringing over bags full of uh, baseball equipment also on this trip. And um, so we want to we bless you. And then, uh, Percy, would you like to say a few words? 
says, Can I take, should I take this off? Leave it yeah, on. you can, yeah. Leave it on. Okay. In Matthew's gospel, Jesus tells us to go and make disciples. In the gospel of Mark, Jesus calls us to go and tell the good news to everyone, everywhere. In the gospel of Luke, Jesus promises to send the Holy Spirit to be with us. And in the gospel of John, Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. What is a mission? It is sending forth people to serve. God sends people on a mission. What is a commission? It is allowing us to act on behalf of another. God commissions people to go. You as a team and as individuals are sent forth by God to a specific service. You as a team and as individuals are sent with a commission from God to go and act on God's behalf. You as a team and as individuals will demonstrate Christ's teachings by loving one another. You as a team and as individuals will serve faithfully to bring honor and glory to God. Amen. So the whole purpose as a church is, you know, we gather to worship, to be inspired, to grow in Christ together. But we don't just kind of keep that here in the church. We don't just keep it in our hearts for our own inspiration. The whole purpose of this is to go out into the world and to be the very hands and heart and presence of Christ in the world to other people, to make the world a better place. And so that's what we're doing. So I want you to raise your hand toward Ron and Dave, and we're going to pray for them. Guiding and loving God, empower these people to be your hands and feet. Help them to glorify you by serving others. Send them into the world to feed the hungry, to shelter the homeless, to warm those who are cold by their actions and words. Make them witnesses of your great love and your passion for rescuing your people. Protect them, teach them, support them as they become the people you want them to be. Fill them with your Holy Spirit and enable them to complete their tasks faithfully and joyfully. Bring them safely home to us and then let them share their experiences which will further enrich us so that we too may glorify you by sharing the love of Christ. Give them strength, wisdom, and love for the work that you give them to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you. Please join me in the prayer for illumination, which is uh, projected on the screen. And this is the prayer <clears throat> that we say to prepare our hearts to open God's holy word. And this is the, uh, the pinnacle of our worship services, is going to God's word. So let us, let us pray together. Open our eyes, Lord, we want to see Jesus, to reach out and touch him and say that we love him. Open our ears, Lord, and help us to listen. Open our eyes, Lord, we want to see Jesus. Amen. Well, the scripture reading this morning is from the book of Exodus chapter 4. Okay, so last week we read uh, from the book of Exodus chapter 3, and that was, the, um, that was the passage where Moses encounters God in the burning bush, the presence of God in the burning bush. And God gives to Moses his purpose, his commissioning. <clears throat> and Moses doubts it. And so we talked about that last week. Well, this, this position, this passage follows after that passage, and as you, as you will see as we get into this scripture, Moses is still doubting God's question to him, God's commission to him. And we can find ourselves in this. God is giving you some task to do in your life, and maybe you're also feeling a resistance to it. Maybe you're also feeling like you want to, um, maybe you're doubting it. Maybe you're arguing with God about what God is asking you and calling you to do. And so... That's where we pick up the passage this morning. Hear the word of God as it is written for us in the book of Exodus chapter 4, verses 1 through 17. Hear the word of God. Moses answered God, But suppose the Israelites do not listen to me, but they say the Lord did not appear to you. And the Lord said to Moses, what is that in your hand? And Moses said, a staff. And God said, throw it on the ground. So he threw the staff on the ground, and it became a snake. And Moses drew back from it 
And then the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand and seize it by the tail. So he reached out his hand and he seized it by the tail. And the Lord said, this is so that they may believe that the Lord. Oh, he, he reached it, uh, grab, reached out his hand, grabbed it by the tail, and it became a shaft again in his hand. And the Lord said, this is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Again, the Lord said to him, put your hand inside your cloak. And so Moses put his hand inside his cloak. And when he took it out, his hand was leprous, as white as snow. Then God said, put your hand back inside your cloak. And so he put his hand back inside his cloak again. And when he took it out, it was restored like the rest of his body. If they will not believe you or heed the first sign, they may believe the second sign. They will not believe, if they will not believe even these two signs or heed you, you shall take some water from the Nile, pour it on the dry ground, and the water that you shall take from the the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. But Moses said to the Lord, O my Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor even now that you've spoken to your servant, but I'm slow of speech and slow of tongue. And when the Lord said this to him, Lord said to him, who gives speech to mortals? Who makes them mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you are to speak. But Moses said, oh, my Lord, please send someone else. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, what about your brother Aaron, the Levite? I know he can speak fluently. Even now he's coming out to meet you. And when he sees you, his heart will be glad. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth. And I will be with your mouth and with his mouth and will teach you what you shall do. He indeed shall speak for you to the people. He shall serve as a mouth for you and you shall serve as God for him. So take in your hand this staff with which you will will perform the signs. Here is the reading of God's word for us. May God help us as we seek to understand the meaning of these words. So last week, God gives Moses this task. Moses doubts his ability to take on the task. Moses says, I can't. I can't. I can't speak. I'm not eloquent. I can't do it. God says, yes, you can And did you notice God says, what do you have in your hand? And Moses says, I have a staff in my hand. What is it that you're saying I can't about in your life? Is God asking you to do something and you're saying, I can't? I had a uh, Moses moment this week where I was saying, I don't know, maybe I can't. Our giving is down $2,000 every week in this church. We are $20,000 down since January, since this calendar year. Before COVID, we had about 400 people connected to the life of this church. And now we have about 120 people still connected. Some people are still attending church in person. Some people are attending church on Zoom. But there are about 280 people who have vanished. They're not joining the Zoom worship. They're not attending in person. I've never met them. Where are they? And so I'm concerned. And I know I'm not alone in this. I read an article this week from one of my colleagues in Pella, Iowa. He's a Reformed Church minister named Steve Vanderwell. And here's what Steve said. This is what he writes. He says, so many people in my congregation have just disappeared. He said, I don't know where they've gone. There's a new term, Steve said. It's called ghosting. Ghosting is ending a relationship, cutting it off with no communication and no warning. So many people, Steve said, have ghosted my church since last March. I've heard nothing from them. I don't know where they are. I don't know if they're angry. 
Are they inordinately scrupulous about positive exposure to COVID? Is that really what it is? Are they just poor communicators? He said, I don't know. But Steve said, I'll admit that as a pastor, I get frustrated at the family that believes that gathering for worship is risky, but basketball tournaments and Boy Scouts are okay. People concerned about how we might celebrate the Lord's Supper safely, but they're not concerned about eating out in restaurants. He said, that frustrates me. He said, it hurts me. It makes me wonder, will they ever show up again when the COVID pandemic is finished? And so I can relate a little bit to some of the things that Steve feels and talks about. I'm just beginning as the pastor here at Hopo Reformed Church, and I feel that the bulk of the people have disappeared. So this week, this was all starting to get to me, and I thought, what are we doing? So many people at Hopewell just don't seem to care. The church either care about coming to church or care about joining the Zoom meetings. They don't care enough to continue their giving. And if they don't care, why should the rest of us care? So I was kind of like Moses this week. God, you called me to do this. The situation's worse than I thought. And if people were committed, that would be one thing, but so many people have ghosted us. What are we doing? And it was right at that point this week that Kim Skorlick <laughs> stepped in and said, first, take a deep breath. Second, remember that God brought you here. You're here for a purpose. Third, what's happening here is happening everywhere in every church. And fourth, we're almost out of COVID, and when we are, this church is going to come back. I needed to hear those words of encouragement from Kim. We're in this together. And I want to say to those people who are missing, don't ghost us. We need you to stick around. We need you to step up and start getting involved in HRC again. We need you to continue giving generously to this church. It's going to take all of us together to make this ministry work. If we continue at the rate we're at, we run out of money in 10 months, game over. So don't, don't go away, stick around. So I felt like Moses this week. God, you called us to this, but what if it doesn't work? And so we start to doubt. God said to Moses, what's in your hand? Moses looked, and in his hand, there was a staff. Now, staff in Hebrew, the word for staff, means an implement of influence. So what Moses had in his hand was an implement of influence, a staff. Well, I looked in my hand this week when I was reading this passage, and what was in my hand? It wasn't a staff, but it was a Bible. That's what was in my hand, a Bible. And that's why I'm here, to know Christ and to make Christ known. And how do we know Christ? Through the Word of God. We come to know Him through the Bible. That's what attracted me to want to serve here. Because in your profile, as you talked about yourself, you said we're a church that wants to study God's Word more deeply. We want to know God's Word more, more completely. We want to grapple with it. And that's, that's what I love to do more than anything else, is to teach God's Word and to study it. So there was a Bible in my hand. What about you? What are you doubting in your life? What kind of call of God is coming to you that you might be, you might be doubting? And what's in your hand? Maybe you're doubting the career that God called you to. Maybe you were called to be a computer programmer. You might be called to IT or tech, but you're saying, God gave this passion to me to focus on tech, but the whole tech industry is moving overseas. All of the jobs are moving overseas. And artificial intelligence is coming. It's thus going to transform the whole industry to the point that my training and my career may be obsolete. What's in your hand? Maybe it's a computer keyboard. God puts something in your hand, a passion, a skill, something. And that something is not going away. Maybe the configuration of the job you thought you were entering is going away. But that skill that God gave you, 
Whatever it is that God put in your hand, that is not going away. Listen to this. Moses doubted God. He said, what if they don't listen? You're telling me this is what I should do. What if they don't listen? God responded to Moses, what's in your hand? A staff was in Moses' hand. Now, what is a staff usually used for? We know from the book of Exodus, from chapter 3 that we just read last week, that Moses had been working as a shepherd. So what he was holding was a shepherd's staff. And a shepherd's staff is used to both, both rescue the sheep out of danger with the hook and with the pointy end to defend the sheep against wolves. That's what Moses had in his hand. But do you know what, what Moses wanted to have in his hand? It was not this. He did not want a shepherd's crook in his hand. What Moses wanted in his, set, in his hand was a scepter. Now, a, a scepter is like a crook. It's like a shepherd's staff. But it's very different in some important ways. It looks the same. A scepter is what the pharaoh holds. I'll show you a picture of the scepter that the pharaoh was holding. It would have looked like this. The pharaoh would have been holding a golden scepter with a cobra's head on top. It's made out of gold with turquoise eyes. That's what Moses wanted to be holding in his hand. Not a wooden stick, but the pharaoh's staff. Moses very likely thought that he should have been the next pharaoh. He probably thought that he was entitled to the Pharaoh's throne. You probably know the story of Moses, but let me just recount it very quickly. Because it's a fascinating story. And here's how the story goes. The Hebrew people were enslaved in Egypt. The Hebrew population was starting to get too large, and that made the Pharaoh nervous, and the Egyptians nervous. So the Pharaoh put out a royal decree that all Hebrew baby boys should be killed by being thrown into the Nile River to keep the Hebrew population down. Instead of putting Moses to death, his mother put the baby Moses in a small boat made out of, um, made out of uh, sap and uh, papyrus. So technically, she obeyed uh, the Pharaoh's orders by casting her baby out into the Nile, only she cast him out on a raft. And the Pharaoh's daughter happened to see the Hebrew baby floating by. And the daughter took pity on the baby and rescued him, drew him out of the water. The name Moses actually means to be drawn out. And she raised him as her own son in the royal palace of the Pharaoh. So Moses, a Hebrew, very strangely, was raised as a royal Egyptian. And it was not inconceivable that he would imagine being heir to the throne. Moses had probably touched that, that uh, scepter that was up on the screen. He wanted a scepter in his hand. If we could put that picture back again for one second. That's what he wanted in his hand. Now do you see it? It's got the head of a cobra on top. It's made of gold. So the first thing about this scepter that Moses wanted in his hand is that it was expensive. It was a thing of immense beauty and value. Moses wanted wealth. The second thing about this scepter, the Pharaoh's scepter, is that it was intimidating. It was meant to strike fear into people. It was a thing of terror. Moses wanted to hold the intimidation of terror in his hand. Third thing about the scepter is that it guarded against hell. According to the Egyptian mythology, the cobra scepter guards, against, guards the gates of the underworld, wards off demons and the enemies of the royal family, and guides the deceased pharaohs on their journey through the underworld. So the pharaoh, Moses, wanted that protection from evil the assurance of salvation. And finally, the scepter was a symbol of power and dominion. The cobra projected the king's power. Moses wanted to hold the royal power in his hand. That's what Moses wanted in his hand. But that's not what he held in his hand. Very often, what God has given us to hold in our hand is not what we thought we wanted in our hand. Maybe you thought you wanted to be holding a resume in your hand that said vice president or CEO of the company but instead you're holding a different title in your hand. Sarah was pointing out to me this week, my Sarah was, uh, we, we very often we talk about the Bible passage during the week together, 
And she was pointing out to me this week as we studied this passage together that over the past four years, I thought that what I wanted to hold in my hand was the status of international diplomat. And I was serving, my job was, I was serving as the representative to the United Nations for the World Council of Churches. And I was given the honor of meeting with church leaders around the world. I was meeting with heads of state, with presidents of countries, and with the heads of militias. I was meeting with members of the UN Security Council, and I was working on peace processes at the highest level. And it was exhilarating work. It was exciting. But the most important moments, as I was reflecting back on that work over the past four years, the most important moments were the moments when I was, happened to uh, be in a pastoral situation with people. For example, there was one time when I was in Colombia, and I had members from the Colombian government with me in the same room with members from the FARC, which was the uh, militia, and there were church leaders gathered there, and there was an impasse in the negotiation. And I said, you know, in addition to being a diplomat, I'm also a pastor, and I'd like to offer prayer right now. And we held hands together, and as we held hands, we prayed together for each other and with each other. And that led to an emotional shift in the, in the negotiation. It led to a shift. Now, I'm not saying that that resolved the problem of the peace, the peace the, uh, the conflict in Colombia is far too complex for that. But it did shift something. There were tears in people's eyes. There was an emotional shift. And it did get us moving in that stage of the negotiation. And so what I discovered in that moment was that it, what God has put into my hand is pastoral work. That what God had put into my hand, that I wasn't um, an international diplomat who happened to also be a pastor. No. I was a pastor who also happened to be doing this diplomatic job for a short time. What has God put in your hand? You may be wishing that you had something else in your hand, like Moses did, but what has God put in your hand? Take time to see it. What is it? I had a friend who thought he wanted to be an art professor. He worked hard to achieve it. He got his MFA from a prestigious art school, and he started looking for art professor jobs after he graduated, which he really had to find because he had a lot of debt from his master's program. He couldn't find the job. But instead, God had put something else into his hand. God had given him 30 years of experience as a counselor in a foster care program. He and his wife were both counselors. And he began to accept what was in his hand and to combine his artistic talent with his work with children. He began to do art therapy with children. That was his true calling. Therapy with children who were traumatized because their parents were incarcerated. That's his mission. And he's so much happier and more effective doing what God had put in his hand, teaching student that, than he would have been teaching college students. God has put something in your hand. What is it? It may not be what you wanted it to be. But if you give it a chance, you might come to terms with what God has put in your hand and it might be a better fit than anything you can imagine. So God says to Moses, Moses, what do you have in your hand? Now, I imagine Moses was ashamed to have to say to God, well, what I have in my hand is only this measly shepherd's staff. I imagine that he wanted to say, I have in my hand the Pharaoh's cobra scepter. But instead, he had to say, I have this shepherd's staff. But look what God does next in the story. God says, oh, you think you want the royal power of the Pharaoh, huh? Okay, you got it. You want to hold the Pharaoh's scepter, the snake scepter? We'll make your staff into a snake. Throw down the staff. Moses throws down the staff. It instantly becomes a snake. And it says that Moses drew away from it. He was afraid of it. God may give you a taste of what you think you want just long enough so that you can see that it's not really what you wanted after all. My friend had a chance to teach art to college students after his MFA program. He got the TA a class, and what he discovered is that he hated it. He hated it. It wasn't for him. I thought I wanted to be an international diplomat, and it was exciting for a period of time I liked to have that experience. But you know what I didn't like? 
I didn't like the emotionless meetings, the endless hours of reading and writing dry statements for Security Council resolutions that I was pretty sure were not ever going to lead to any cessation of conflict. It was the pastoral work that really made me happy. It was the rare occasions when I got to preach, like when I was working on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and I was invited to preach at St. George's Cathedral in Jerusalem. That's what God put into my hand. God will sometimes allow you to taste and experience what you think it is that you want in your hand. So God turns Moses' staff into a snake. And God will also test you. What God has put into your hand is a tool, it's a calling, it's a passion, it's a natural interest. And that doesn't mean that using it is going to be easy, just because it's natural. God was preparing Moses. Moses was afraid of the snake. He drew away. God says, reach out your hand and seize the snake. Did you see this detail in the story? Seize the snake by where? By the tail. Any snake specialist will tell you that that's the wrong way to pick up a snake. The safe way to pick up a snake, if you don't want to get bitten, is to pick it up where? Right behind the head. So they can't beat you. So they can't bite you. So that you're controlling it. What happens if you pick it up by the tail? If you pick a snake up by the tail, it's going to coil back and strike you. So God is testing Moses. He's having to take the greatest risk with this thing. Moses obeys. He picks it up by the tail. And what happens? The snake turns back into a shepherd's staff. And Moses is relieved. You will be relieved when you have tried the thing that you thought you wanted and finally go back to the natural thing that you were called to, when you go back to the thing that you're most gifted at, the thing that comes most naturally to you, then you'll be at peace. There'll be still a lot of hard work, but you'll no longer be enticed by the high status option after having that experience. So Moses was content with the staff. And he was willing to face danger. And he would need that for the next 40 years in the wilderness. He would need that ability to face danger and take risk. The Pharaoh's scepter was meant to lead with power and intimidation. A shepherd's staff is made to lead the flock with care. A Pharaoh's staff terrifies. A shepherd's staff rescues and defends. God wanted the shepherd's staff in the hand of Moses for the work that lay ahead. We need courage to use the implement that God has put into our hands. Sarah felt this at one point. She, um, she was invited to become the executive director of an elder care organization. You know, her whole career is elder care. And she accepted the position, but she just wasn't happy. Administration was not her passion. She missed the direct work with elderly people. She missed the discussions about end-of-life issues and managing palliative, palliative care. And then she found the job at Woodland Pond as the Director of Resident Services. And it takes her courage to have those conversations with people every day. Just because you found the tool that God has put into your hand doesn't mean that it's going to be easy, an easy road ahead. She still has to have difficult conversations. So Moses had found his calling. He was not going to be the Pharaoh like he wanted. He was not going to lead the nation of Egypt. Instead, he was going to free the nation of Israel. He was going to have to go up against the Pharaoh. He had his calling defined, he had his courage tested, and he was ready to use his shepherd's staff with God's power behind it. And listen to what he did with that staff. That's the same staff that Moses used to part the Red Sea. That was the same staff that he used to touch the rock when the Israelites were dying of thirst in the desert. Moses touches the rock, the rock gushes forth with water, and he gives water for the Israelites to survive in the desert. That staff would become his tool. We're traveling through Lent to Easter, from this period of darkness to the place of light and life. God has put some tool into your hand, some purpose, some passion, something to accomplish. Live courageously. Accept the, go the calling that God has placed into your hand. Let us pray. God, sometimes we think that what we want, that we know what we want, 
and yet you show us that it's maybe not truly what we want. And as we go through our metamorphosis, through our own change in becoming new in Christ, we have to shed these old ideas that didn't fit us. We have to throw down the calling that we thought we wanted, and we have to pick up the new calling that you have for us. God, help us to see what you've placed in our hands. Give us the humility to accept what you've put into our hands, and give us the vision to see the great purpose that you want to give us with that calling. Through Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The closing song is Whom Shall I Fear? You hear me when I call, you are my morning song. Though darkness fills the night, it cannot hide the light. Whom shall I fear? You crush the enemy underneath my feet. You are my sword and shield, no troubles linger still. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I fear? I know who goes before me, I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. My strength is in your name. For you alone can save, you will deliver me, yours is the victory. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I fear? I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind, the God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. Nothing for the gain. the whole world in your hands. I'm holding on to your promises. You are faithful. You are faithful. Nothing for against me shall stand. You hold the whole world in your hands. I'm holding on to your promises. You are faithful. You are faithful. You are faithful. I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind, the God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind, the God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. 
the God of angel armies is always by my side. The God of angel armies is always by my side. And now look at your hand. What is it that God has put into your hand? What purpose, what tool has God given to you? And now use that tool with courage. Accept what God has put into your hand. Go out and serve God. Serve God in the world. Serve God in this community. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace now and forever. Amen.
mix it on the drum kit and you get a, a stereo.
see the, you can see the uh, just barely. You can see the numbers coming up. Yeah. Now I can change the talkback volume. But that really doesn't really increase it that much. Yeah. Well, that should be enough to hear it. Actually, but that's all.